Bueno, ¿me oís? Vamos a... Eh, profesor Coronado, por favor, tome asiento. Vamos a seguir con la, con la segunda parte de, de la jornada. Eh, sí. Eh, inesperadamente me va a tocar presentar a, a uno de realmente de mis mejores amigos en el, en el ámbito profesional. Es el profesor Aurelio Mateo Alonso, aunque todos los conocemos como, como Coque. Eh, y, y nada, yo no he tenido tiempo para preparar más nada, pero os voy a dar simplemente unas, unas notas biográficas. Coque se licenció en la Autónoma de Madrid, él es de hecho madrileño de origen, de hecho si hablaréis con él os diría que no es madrileño exactamente, es del barrio del Pilar, que es una, una gradación específica dentro de, dentro de Madrid. Y la leyenda cuenta que en el, las aulas de la Autónoma, Coque tuvo un profesor de química orgánica, que seguro que ya era catedrático entonces, no, no, no lo sé seguro, que se llama Tomás Torres, que le inspiró para seguir con una carrera académica y Coque decidió irse fuera de España y de hecho es algo muy característico de Coque, es, es una persona que siempre para mí ha sido un símbolo de independencia científica en ese sentido, no ha sido una persona nunca continuista, decidió irse fuera de España a empezar la tesis en el año 2000 y se graduó como doctor en, en química, bueno, él estuvo trabajando en química física en el Queen Mary de Londres, pasó a hacer un postdoc con, con Mauricio Prato en Trieste, si no recuerdo mal, hasta el año 2009, pues trabajando en temas relacionados con modificación de nanotubos, química de fulerenos, supra, eh, supramolecular chemistry, ese tipo de cosas, y en 2009 ya pasó a ser joven PI o ya un, ya un research leader en un grupo que empezó a crear en, en Frías, en el Instituto de Estudios Avanzados, si no recuerdo mal, se llamaba, hasta el año 2012, donde ya, y es importante porque luego de esto se hablará esta tarde, eh, a través de uno de estos programas de captación de talento, específicamente el del gobierno vasco, el programa Iker Basque, Coque eh, volvió a España y volvió a, a Polimat, que es su centro actualmente, donde él dirige el grupo de materiales eh, y materiales supramoleculares dentro de, de ese centro. Y para mí personalmente creo que ha sido una persona muy importante, porque creo que cualquier investigador joven, aunque yo ya no sea tan joven, necesita tener una referencia no muy lejana en edad. Es decir, una persona que seguramente se ha enfrentado a los desafíos que tú te estás enfrentando tres o cuatro años antes y al que puedas pedir consejo y para mí Coque fue esa persona. Cuando te enfrentas a pedir tu primer proyecto nacional o cuando te enfrentas a, a lo mejor a una entrevista RC o a plantearte un proyecto, Coque por edad había pasado por ahí antes y para mí pues, fue una persona muy, muy importante. Y no he hablado nada de la ciencia que hace, pero eso ya lo va a contar él, es para mí una referencia en sistemas poliaromáticos, ahora está extendiendo la química de poliaromáticos a química reticular, sistemas de tipo COF, trabajado mucho en electrónica molecular, y ya está, Coque, de Floris George, y muchas gracias por venir. Aquí te la dejas, con todo el virus. Eh, bueno, muchas gracias, eh, Carlos, por la presentación. No hay nada nunca mejor que te, que te introduzca un amigo. Entonces, así queda, queda todo muy bien y parece que eres eh, mejor de lo que realmente uno es. Quería dar las gracias a Eugenio por haberme invitado a venir a Valencia. Esta es la segunda charla que doy desde que, en vivo desde que empezó la pandemia. Ayer estábamos hablando que a lo mejor estamos un poco ya incluso oxidados y no preparados para dar para dar charlas, pero bueno, vamos a ver qué, qué tal va. Eh, eh, voy a cambiar directamente el inglés, eh, simple, simplemente luego justo cuando empiece la presentación científica. Lo iba a hacer en euskera, pero bueno, eh, que, es que Nazario no entiende, entonces mejor, mejor lo dejamos así y ya está. Entonces, bueno, voy a, voy a hacer simplemente una pequeña mención sobre un poco de dónde vengo, eh, de, del instituto del que vengo, a ver si esto funciona... Sí. Bueno, pues vengo, vengo de Polimat, del Instituto de, de Materiales Poliméricos de, de San Sebastián, no de San Sebastián de los Reyes, sino de San Sebastián, Donostia San Sebastián. Eh, y allí, pues eh, como ha dicho Carlos, lidero el grupo de materiales moleculares eh, y supramoleculares. Eh, hoy justo hemos estado hablando de innovación y, y 
para mí, cuando entré en Polimat, es, es, un, es un instituto particularmente extraño, por decirlo de alguna forma. Es un instituto que, de acuerdo a los estándares de ahora, se ha construido al revés. O sea, es un instituto que ya tenía eh, de por sí una relación muy fuerte y muy intensa con la industria, una transferencia muy, muy amplia, muchas patentes, muchas licencias, muchas colaboraciones con la industria, y lo que ha querido hacer Polimat ha sido expandir la base de investigación fundamental. Y justo en ese momento es cuando entro yo en, en, en Polimat. O sea, Polimat, eh, gracias a una financiación del Gobierno Vasco, que es el programa BERC, que es para crear nuevos institutos eh, de excelencia, eh, pues se, se crea este eh, otro instituto que también se llama Polimat y que es complementario al Polimat aplicado, vamos a decir así, y entonces justo en ese momento eh, eh, entro yo. Entonces, al final, se puede decir, es lo que les decía, es, es un instituto que se ha hecho un poco pues, de arriba abajo más que, que de abajo arriba, donde la transferencia ya estaba de alguna forma asegurada y se quería ampliar a otras, a otras eh, líneas eh, de investigación. Entonces, bueno, yo en esta... No sé qué ocurre. A ver si ahora... Sí. Entonces, bueno, aquí fundamentalmente yo trabajo en tres líneas de investigación. Eh, una que es la síntesis... Ah, ok, I'll switch now. Ok, so mostly, mostly here I, I am working on three research lines. One of them involves the synthesis of extended uh, or pi aromatic systems, or, or pi extended systems that extend in one, two, in one, two and three uh, dimensions. Uh, these are very old systems, very, very well known, but very recently we have changed their name and it sounds actually much cooler. So, for example, graphene nanoribbons or nanographenes have been long known as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And you see, for example, uh, all these uh, graphitic systems, you see, they have been studied for, for about a century already. Um, the other thing that we are interested, besides the synthesis of these systems, is in how these systems arrange and they organize. Uh, uh, in, in condensed phases, and this is because depending on the organizations of these systems uh, in the solid state, we can, th this organization dominates the bulk properties of, of the material, but also because we can use these uh, supramolecular forces to make other supramolecular systems like, like polymers. And in collaboration with other groups, we uh, tend to explore the potential applications of these uh, uh, systems in electronic and, and energy applications. So, although I hate synthesis very, very much, I have to say that this is probably 95% of, of the work that we do, to develop new synthetic methods to, to synthesize uh, all, all these compounds. All right, so coming back to the title of my talk, of course I'm gonna talk about some graphene derivatives. So I think, I mean, I'm going to go very quickly through this because I think you all know what is graphene. So it's a single uh, uh, atom layer of carbon that was discovered in 2004. It was simply made by, it's just simply one of the layers of, of uh, uh, graphite. So graphite is con constituted by these graphene layers that are very tightly packed. So in 2004, just simply by using a scotch tape, they were able to exfoliate and to isolate one of these uh, layers. So uh, why, why is graphene so interesting? Well, basically, it's the thinnest object possible. It's just one atom thin. And this makes, or it provides it with, with very interesting properties, like it's transparent, it's flexible. And because of all these applications, it has been envisioned as a, a key material to develop ultra thin and flexible uh, electronic applications. The truth is that for all these electronic applications, you generally need a, a semiconductor, but, but graphene, you see, is actually not a semiconductor. It's what we call a zero-gap semiconductor, and it's pretty much uh, another metal. So one of the ways to, to make graphene a semiconductor or to open a band gap, because this is what you would like to do to make uh, uh, these uh, derivatives uh, a semiconductor, is uh, to to chop graphene into smaller pieces. So imagine that you take some scissors, you start cutting little pieces of graphene out. And you see by, by cutting all graphene in smaller pieces by something called quantum confinement, you are able to open this gap and gap. 
and you can get compounds with completely different properties. So one of the things that we've been uh, interested in very recently is in graphene nanoribbons. So graphene nanoribbons is nothing else that if you take a graphene layer and if you consider that it's a piece of paper and with your scissors, you, you cut it in stripes. So, so these stripes, in some cases, they have uh, a bang gap. So they have shown a lot of uh, application potential in several fields like in electronics, in energy conversion and storage, photonics and, and spintronics. So why is such an interesting compound for, for an organic chemist? Let me see if we can go through. This is really a very clear example of a compound which is, th th their properties are completely dominated by the structure of the material. So one of the key things of, of graphene nanoribbons is that you can control their metallicity by controlling the edge structure. So for example, if you have an edge like this, which is an, arm, an armchair edge, these systems are semiconducting. If you have a zigzag edge, this system is metallic. But if you remove some of these fused benzene rings in the units to get these indented edges, you get again a semiconducting material. So you see, it allows you to play with the metallicity uh, directly of the system. Then if you have a semiconducting system by playing with the width of the, uh, of the nanoribbon, you can control the gap of the system and the same thing with the length. So the length, as you uh, increase the length of the nanoribbon, the band gap is going to narrow until you uh, reach basically saturation of, of that band gap. And then another thing that you can do is you can, for example, exchange some of the carbon atoms in the core for some heteroatoms. And that is going to also to allow you to further tune uh, the structure of all these systems. So one fundamental thing of research in, in graphene nanoribbons is really to achieve atomic precision across all these uh, uh, different parameters in order to first establish their properties and also to exploit them. You see, I, I'm, I'm talking about establishing their properties because a lot of the work that has been done to date regarding their properties is, is theoretical. And you see, basically, it's very, very important to be able to have the material in your hands so you can also, besides proving that some of the predicted uh, properties are actually correct, at the same time, you can uh, explore other properties. You see, this is something, this is the, pow the power of having some powders uh, in your hands, that it allows you to go somewhere else to a different lab and test something completely different. Okay, so how do you synthesize uh, all these graphene nanoribbons? Well, there are several methods. They are divided in, in top-down methods and in bottom-up methods. So top-down is what physicists like. So they usually start with a larger object and then they break it down into a graphene nanoribbon. So one of the earliest methods to synthesize these ribbons was the method of unzipping carbon nanotubes. I th so you see, uh, a carbon nanotube is, not, is nothing else than, than a roll-up uh, graphene layer. So what you do is you unroll it by unzipping it. And to do this, what you do is you oxidize them uh, strongly or reduce them strongly using a strongly reducing agents or oxidizing agents, and then you rip off uh, you, you make a rip along the longitudinal um, uh, axis of the tube, and then you end up with a graphene nanoribbon. The thing is that this method doesn't provide absolutely any control, and then you get defects all, all over the structure. The good thing of this method is that it is scalable. So you see, if you want to, for example, to make a, a graphene nanoribbons to study their mechanical properties or for filling uh, uh, applications or something like this, this is really the, the way uh, to make them because you can make them in, in really large scales. Another way to do this, which is also bottom, uh, sorry, top down, is etching graphene, and this really relates to taking the scissors and cutting uh, small pieces. So you start with a graphene layer, and what you do is either by etching or by lithography, you chop off uh, one of the, of the ends, and then you end up with something like this that also is going to have defects all over the structure. Uh, the way chemists do things is bottom up, as I was saying, which for us is actually much, much nicer. So, and, and I would say that currently this is the best way to, to make uh, a, a graphene nanoribbons with uh, atomic precision. And this involves designing some small monomers that you are going to polymerize 
and then in a second step, or sometimes both together, you graphitize the system in order to get the system that you want. So this polymerization, graphitization approach works actually very, very nicely. It works in surfaces, it works in the bulk, and it provides you control about, uh, along the edge and the width, but not about the length, because you see the length is dominated by the polydispersity of, of the polymer. And, and while in the case of on-surface synthesis, this is really low throughput, uh, in the case of bulk synthesis, you really can make, I mean, not tones, but you can make a reasonable amount for scientists uh, to play with. There is actually another route that I haven't discussed, and which is multi-step organic synthesis. So actually, you see multi-step organic synthesis can provide atomic precision over all completely uh, different parameters that we need to uh, control in order to control their properties. But if you look at the elongated aromatic systems that have been uh, synthesized to date, you're going to see that we are facing several limitations. Uh, for example, if you, if you synthesize uh, uh, the, the acin series, which are the narrowest, uh, uh, you can, we can consider these acins the narrowest uh, graphene nanoribbons, we have been only able to synthesize these guys up to nine rings. Uh, and, the, and I'm talking in bulk. In, in surface, you can make them up to 12, but in bulk, up to nine rings. And actually, this is, uh, this is because these systems are highly unstable. And for example, this nanacin has a half lifetime of one and a half hour. So this means that the PhD student synthesizes it and runs all over the place in, in order to get all the characterization done before it decomposes. But still, you see, this is really a, a very good, <laughs> uh, this is really a, a fantastic uh, uh, goal achieved. You can make longer systems if you extend laterally the conjugation, because by doing so, at the end, what you're going to do is you're going to stabilize, let's say like this, the main backbone of the graphene nanoribbon. And by doing so, people have been able to synthesize, uh, and this is uh, up to 2017, uh, people have been able to synthesize uh, graphene nanoribbons completely uh, monodispersed, so with atomic precision also over the length, up to five nanometers. So if you really think and you compare this uh, synthetic, full synthetic chemistry approach with the polymerization and graphitization approach, these numbers are actually very low because with the polymerization graphitization approach, you can reach 100 microns, approximately. You see, it's believed that, but that in some, in some, uh, some nanoribbons can each uh, those uh, lengths, although it hasn't been proved. But you see, it's, it's a very good method, and, and synth synthetic chemistry cannot really compete with polymerization in this uh, concerns. So actually, why, why is this? Let me see if we can get this work. So, so why is this? Uh, well, actually, you see, synthesizing nanoribbons in this way is very, very challenging. The first thing that we are facing is that we have to develop and optimize a very large number of different synthetic and, purif um, um, and purification steps. So if we, if we actually go back, if we go back to the number of uh, steps that people have used to synthesize those systems, look at these numbers, 12 uh, steps, 13 steps, 16 steps, 17 steps. This is natural product synthesis. So, so you see, we are reaching that level of complexity on the synthetic roots. The other problem that, that actually we are facing is the lack of solubility of the resulting compounds and also of many of the intermediates. And actually, this is a, a very, very big problem. You see, people doesn't often talk about this, but solubility is probably one of the biggest challenges that we are facing. Actually, when you have a highly planar and highly conjugated system, it tends to aggregate in solution by pi stacking, and you usually end up with powders which are really, really difficult to play with. And, and this is uh, really a, a, a big, big problem, because you see, this lack of solubility makes very difficult synthesis, purification, and characterization. Think that we are organic chemists, we want to play with things like this. So if your compounds are not soluble, you cannot make the reactions, you cannot cook the reactions. Most of the reactions that we deal with, they deal with uh, uh, homogeneous reactions in solution. So if your compound 
is not soluble, you're not going to be able to perform any of these reactions. The same thing applies for purification techniques. So most of purification techniques, they rely on liquid phases, so your compounds must be soluble in order to be able to, to purify them. And the same thing applies for characterization. You see, you, of course you can do solid state NMR, but if you see the resolution of a solid state NMR versus a liquid phase uh, NMR, you can really tell the difference. So ideally we want all these guys to be completely soluble, so it basically it makes our life much, much easy from all perspectives. So with all these things in mind, uh, we decided to, uh, to focus on a new approach that would allow us to make uh, these graphene nanoribbons and that it, in, in a way it would allow us to overcome all these different challenges. So the idea was to design a building block that even if it is very, very difficult to synthesize, once that we have it, uh, if, if we design our, our building block carefully, the idea was uh, to use this building block in such a way that you can put one after the other in an iterative process. So, and that this process, it can be repeated, very, very always the same process. So you see, the, in the same way as in a factory. So you put one, then you put the other one, then you put the other one, and then you repeat this process until you have reached the length that you want, and then you stop, okay? So <coughs> this building block that we have synthesized, which is actually this guy that was uh, uh, there, uh, it consists, well, I, I'm gonna tell you, this already takes 12 steps of synthesis, okay? So you see, it's also not very uh, uh, easy to make but you, you're gonna see how useful it can, it can become. So one of the, the this system is basically a dibenzo, uh, a dibenzo uh, diatha tetracin derivative. And this uh, system, what it has is, okay. Let me see, yes, I'm, I'm gonna put myself here because you see, I think it's, it's so basically it has, in this end it has orthodiamines. In this other end it has some protected dions and we actually have selective uh, these uh, functional groups because we know that di diamines and dions, they converge through the formation of a pyrazin ring. So this is going to be our fuse, or our reaction that is going to allow us to fuse the two uh, systems together. Note that in this case, the uh, dions are protected, and we have done this on purpose to avoid polymerization, because you see, if this was actually free, it will polymerize without any control. So like this, we can control the, the, the polymerization. Then we have introduced, okay, yes, these uh, stabilizing lateral rings, as I mentioned to you, if the nanoribbons are very narrow, they become very, very unstable, and the idea was to put these additional two rings so we have some lateral extension of the conjugation or some cross conjugation, and like this we can make the systems unstable. And a very, very important thing, probably the most important of all, are these solubilizing groups. So you see, they have to be there. If you, for example, exchange the, these, uh, these two combination of groups, these terbutyls and these triisobutyl silyl groups, if you don't use these two guys, the nanoribbons are not soluble. We tested them. So you see, if you put tips here, so you remove one atom for one of these, uh, from each of these uh, chains, it's completely insoluble. So you see, it's, it's really a disaster. And I cannot really emphasize more how important is choosing the right combination of solubilizing groups. Okay, so now we have everything. Okay, I told you, we have 12 steps of synthesis already. But now, once that we have our building block available, we take this pyrene tetron, we take this, or an excess of this uh, over building block, we do a double cyclocondensation reaction, and in just one step, we got a nanoribbon with 10 linearly fused rings. Then we take, oops. Yes, so we take this guy, and what we do is we deprotect the 
quinones at the end, and then we allow it to react again with two equivalents of the building block that we already synthesize, and by doing so, in a second step, we get an nanoribbon with 20 linearly fused rings. And if we repeat this process one again, so we take this guy, we deprotect the terminal quinones, and then we perform a third cyclocondensation reaction, then we get, again, in one third step, a nanoribbon with 30 linearly fused rings. So if we compare our nanoribbon with all the molecular nanoribbons or monodispersed nanoribbons that, that had been synthesized uh, to that date, we can see that we have passed from five to eight, and of course, the good thing of this uh, approach is that we can potentially keep, keep growing. And this is something that we are currently uh, playing with. As I said, solubility is a very, very important thing. And these are just, I'm not gonna go through the NMRs, but these are the NMRs of these nanoribbons in chloroform at 25 degrees. So this is the standard conditions that we use to characterize any organic molecule. And as you can see, they are all perfectly soluble, and you can assign all the different peaks to the structure of the nanoribbons. And also, because these nanoribbons are below 7,000 uh, in mass, we can even do high-resolution mass spectrometry, and they actually match perfectly with the uh, structure that, that we were uh, expecting. An important thing that I haven't measured uh, that I haven't mentioned is that also we have purified these compounds by standard flash chromatography. So there is, so everything is completely standard. A standard organic chemistry or organic synthesis purification techniques. So we wanted also to see if we could extrapolate these things to make, to, to, to make other types uh, of structures. And we thought about going into star shaped nanographins. These are similar structures that they just simply uh, span in two, di in two dimensions. And uh, in a way, they are more challenging not to synthesize, but are more challenging to deal with because as you expand the, the pi system in two dimensions, they have a higher tendency to aggregate. So again, this is the problem of solubility that we are facing. So you see, to that day, these were the, the, the examples that have been uh, prepared which you see, as you can see, they are much shorter in comparison as those of the nanoribbons for this, for this reason, for this uh, solubility reason. So, I mean, we, we weren't very creative on this one. So we took our building block, we took this guy that was commercially available, and we tried to perform this triple cyclocondensation reaction. Let's see if it works. Yes. And as you can see, oh, okay, I am going to go back. So as you can see, this is gray because we didn't obtain that compound. This is because the triisopropyl silyl groups are very close to each other, and because of aesthetic hindrance, what we are actually getting instead, it's the double cyclocondensation reaction, and we are getting this, this quinone. So, Okay, this, this has gone by itself now. Okay, so let me see. All right, so with all this in mind, we decided to change our strategy and uh, we designed this other building block, this central core, in which all the quinones, in this case, are very far away from each other. So like this, we would avoid all that uh, uh, aesthetic hindrance that we had in the previous system. And indeed, when we took this guy and we reacted with our building block, with an excess of our building block, we could, in just one step, synthesize this uh, uh, star shaped nanographene that has already a diameter of 4.1 nanometers. And then in the same way, what we did is we deprotected the terminal quinones at the end, and then we perform a second cyclocondensation reaction. And in a second step, we were able to obtain a disc with 6.5 nanometers. So you see, we are being able to make very, very large systems also by the, that extend into dimensions by this methodology. Similarly, we were able to characterize First, to purify these guys by a standard flash chromatography. So again, no, 
nothing different. So n nothing different for the, for, for the standard organic chemistry laboratory, and we were able also to characterize them fully by proton, carbon, and high resolution mass spectrometry. And this is just simply the NMR to show you that the systems are perfectly soluble, chloroform, 25 degrees. You can start noting that these systems, they start broadening. <laughs> And this is because you see the, the 2D effect, let's call it like this. So as the system is, it elongates in two, di in two dimensions, it, the, you start feeling the, the lack of solubility and it's reflected by these broader signals. Anyways, okay, so I mean, uh, this all looked very, very good. We wanted to keep working in this direction and we had decided to explore the synthesis of molecular nanoribbons with, with different edges. So you see, we've been playing with these pirazoquinoxalins, we've been playing with these uh, pinene derivatives. So the idea was to introduce something else in the game. And you see, we spice it up with these uh, coronine derivatives. So, I mean, the, the idea uh, was to use this uh, iterative uh, strategy that I have uh, just shown you but actually we fail miserably. <laughs> so you see, we try to combine it. Uh, of course, the chemistry was completely different and it's really very difficult. You see, sometimes people doesn't realize that it's really very difficult to get all the protective groups and everything working at once. So in, from this perspective, uh, uh, we fail, but we were able to obtain a wide variety of new building blocks. And, and these are these guys that you are seeing in the slide. I am not going to go, don't, don't get scared because I'm not going to go through all this synthetic uh, procedure. But you see, by using this synthetic route, as you can see, we were able to make many, many different compounds. And you see, one of the things we did was, for example, to take compound B and compound A, and we cook them together. Okay, let's wait, no. No, 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 it's, uh, it's on, it's just simply disconnect from the Bluetooth. Okay, so uh, if you, we select this, those, those two, and we perform this double cyclocondensation reaction, in one step we get an anoribon with 13 linearly fused rings. If we go back to this step and we select, for example, E and C, let's see, and we uh, cook them together, we get in another step an anoribon with 33 linearly fused rings. This is already longer than the one that I have uh, previously shown you. And if we go back and then we take D and E, I guess, by cooking together these two guys, we were able to obtain an anoribon with 53 linearly fused rings. So if we compare it with the other generation of systems, we are talking now about an object with 13 nanometers. This is not only the longest monodispersed uh, nanoribbon synthesized to this date, but it's also the longest nanographene. So you see, there is not a largest aromatic core uh, of, of a nanographene with, with a size larger like this. So you see actually uh, one uh, reported one, I, I don't remember, I think it's 658 uh, in, in early January this year, and this came out in, in May, and we are around 350 or 320. You see, I don't remember the names. And I'm talking, this is the number of atoms in the conjugated core. For, you see, not taking into account the solubilizing chains. This was actually quite surprising uh, for, for us because, you see, we were able, actually I bought a, a preparative GPC <laughs> because, you see, I was expecting that these compounds were going to be insoluble at some point, but we were able to purify them by standard flash chromatography and also to get proper proton carbon and high resolution mass spectra data for, for all these uh, systems. So you see, again, this is, these are the NMRs of these systems in chloroform at 25 degrees. So you see, there is, it's, it was even surprising uh, uh, for me. So, so why, why, why are these guys so, so soluble? You see, it's, 
is, 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 is it just the solubilizing groups? Uh, you see, because in the early system, we saw the fatigue of some of our solubilizing groups as we were growing. So this is why in this system we started equipping these systems with longer groups. But here there is something else in, in the equation, and, and this is that these systems possess a distorted aromatic core. So uh, this is actually the crystal structure of the smallest uh, ribbon, and one of the things that we observe, if you think about this system of these junctions here, these four junctions that you see in there, in there there are two hydrogens that are not drawn, but these two hydrogens, they don't have enough space uh, to be in the same plane, so this means that one hydrogen has to sit on top of the other, and it's going to distort the pi system. So in this case, this uh, distortion, the, the, the system is, not, is twisted, but it is not blocked. So actually it can flip between the two different conformations. And, and the combination of the solubilizing groups, the twisted structure that makes difficult pi stacking, and also this, uh, let's say, dynamic behavior, is what it really renders these uh, compounds highly, uh, or makes them very highly soluble uh, in solution. So why am I bringing uh, this to you? It's because of the last topic of, of, of my talk that I would like to discuss uh, uh, today. And you see, basically, this is also to show you that aromatics uh, can be are not so rigid as we, th we tend to think that they are highly planar and highly rigid structures, and at the end you see they are not so rigid and they can adopt uh, different uh, twisted uh, conformations. So if you have one joint, as I was saying to you before, you can have a twisted conformation that it can be flipping from one side to the other one, so you get a twisted system, but if you have uh, two joints, you start getting a new flethora of uh, uh, conformations. So if you have two turns, and these two turns are in the same direction, you get an helical conformation, and if they happen in opposite directions, you get an alternative conformation. So actually the helical conformations, as you can imagine, let's see if this works, okay, are uh, quite interesting. First of all, because you start getting chiral conformations. So if you have chiral aromatic systems that tend to absorb in the visible and emit in the visible and in the near IR, you can get the absorption and emission of circularly polarized light, and this enables uh, a series of, of applications. But also these systems become very, very interesting for something called chiral-induced spin selectivity, in which basically it has been proved that if you pass a current through a chiral molecule, in some cases, you can get uh, an spin polarized current. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> so, so well, actually, there are many, many uh, helical aromatic systems, and you see, this is just uh, a. Um, uh, compilation of, of many of the systems that have been uh, synthesized, and I would say that one of the early approaches to make these helical aromatics is that one uh, reported by, by Pascal uh, back in 2004, and just simply by, by using this overcrowding approach, you see, by just simply populating all the different positions of this tetrabenzo uh, pentacin derivative with all these phenyl groups what you get is an helical system. The phenyls, they don't have enough space to be in the plane, so they induce this turn. Actually, you see, Pascal was able, the, the, these are not very stable conformationally, but Pascal was able to, um, Pascal was able to, um, to, um, uh, uh, to resolve them. Uh, using chiral HPLC, but in a matter of one day, if I remember correctly, they, they racemize. If you, for example, have this type of edges, which are the type of edges that, that we have uh, in our ribbons, uh, which are the cove regions, you cannot isolate them. So these guys are constantly flipping 
So there is no stability. They are highly dynamic, they are moving upside down, and they do not stop. If you freeze the conformation, for example, in the solid state, people has been able to observe mostly the alternated conformation. But this, at the end, in the solid state, the comparison solid state, uh, liquid state, it doesn't make any sense because you see in, in solution is all dynamic and all alive. If you, for example, take a fjord region, which you see would correspond to a 5 helicin, and you put some terbutyl groups, then these guys, they cannot flip anymore. So you can lock the conformation. And actually, there are two very nice examples from Campania and from, from Wang that actually came out the very same year. And, and Campania reported the alternated conformation of the same trimer, OK? So you see this is. Uh, Okay, if this is on the plane of the page, this is fronting, this is facing towards the audience, and this is so it's up, down, up. And in the case of one system, he was able to isolate the helical one. So basically what you do is you perform your reaction, and once that you get it, you pass it through an HPLC column, you separate the alternative from the helical, and then once that you have the helical, what you do is you resolve with a chiral column the two enantiomers of the helical one. So actually, you see, this is a, a very complicated process to make all this really homochiral. Okay, so big question. So can we induce single-handed helicity on these systems? You see, it's, it's really a complicated process to make chiral aromatics. You see, sometimes we take papers, we see them, oh, yeah, they resolve them. It's, this is their CD spectrum. It's really not that easy. It's, it's really, really hard work, hard work. So you see, sometimes papers, they, they really don't show that. But it's really, really hard synthetic work to, to, to play with, with large aromatics, especially if they are chiral. So it's really much more complicated. So we wanted to see if we could find a way to induce this chirality on, 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 this, uh, on these systems. So uh, you see, to, to, to attempt this, what we did was to select a very a small nanoribbon with two twists, something that we can actually make in our lab in a reasonable amount. And the guy that we chose was this, this system that with this coronin and with two few spirins at the edges. It has, you see, two, two turns, as I discussed before. So this is a four helicin, four helicin, four helicin, four helicin. This can flip. You can have two conformations. And actually, if you do a conformational analysis of this system, what you are going to get is an alternative conformation, which is actually the most stable one. And then this guy is going to be con continuously interconverting with the helical in one direction and with the helical in the other direction. So this is continuously flipping into one and eight, and you can see the populations here. So this is actually more favor. All right. So th we said, okay, let's take these guys. We take a, a couple of uh, screwdrivers. We place them on each side, and we just simply turn. So we turn on one direction, we go to the other end, we turn in the same direction, and because we are in opposite directions, we are actually turning in opposite directions, and then we try to make this guy chiral. So, so how, how do we do this? Well, oops, <laughs> let's go back. OK, so the idea or the, wh what we did in this situation was we took this core, OK? And then we fuse this cyclo, uh, cyclo, uh, cot, COTs. <laughs> so, so we fuse these eight member rings at both ends. And you see, because these eight member rings are oversized, what we introduce in the system is ring tension. So this ring tension, it, it generates, um, it, it generates, um, uh, I mean, it, it, it introduces this uh, tension in the system. And then if that tension is chiral, we can induce chirality in what direction? So what we have done is we have equipped these eight member rings with bind up groups. And this is going to allow us to induce this uh, or to, to induce this uh, uh, tension in just one single direction. So you see, if, if we choose rightly our, uh, our chiral inducers, we should be able to induce chirality 
in, in one uh, single direction. You see, actually, I'm trying to get the word that I, uh, that I have used in the paper, and I have completely forgotten. You see, it's not tension, it's uh, chiral, chiral strain, exactly. So it's, this is the word that I was missing. So, so basically, as you increase the size of the rings, you introduce this ring strain, and this ring strain, if it is chiral because we have the bind-up groups, this chiral strain is going to propagate in the same direction across the pi conjugated backbone. Thanks, I completely missed this, this, this word. Okay, so how do we synthesize these guys? Uh, basically, we take this system, we make the quinone, we actually react it with this binum group, and in just if, if these two are, you can buy them with the completely different chirality. You cook it, you get the RR, you cook it with the S, and then, and then you get the SS. And once that you get them, the thing that we do, uh, is, you see, you, we obtain, this is the RR in this case, so if, you, if we do the conformational analysis of this uh, molecule, what the calculations actually predict is exactly the story that I was telling you. The chirality, the, the chiral strain induced by the eight member rings stabilizes the, conform the helical conformation in the P direction, which is by far the most stable population by, uh, in comparison with the two others, the, and then the alternative and the opposite helical conformation become actually residual. The best way to test if this actually happens is by doing circular dichroism. So when we put these molecules and, and we studied and we got the, the dichroic spectrum for the two different uh, um, for the two different enantiomers, we got completely opposite spectra as we were expecting. And the powerful thing of calculations is that they allow you to calculate each of the different spectra for the different conformers. So we calculated the helical one and also the alternative one, and what we can see is that the helical matches perfectly with the uh, uh, experimental one. So basically, we can actually say that in solution, this uh, uh, conformation becomes uh, preferential. And you see, again, by having all these models that perfectly fit with the uh, experiment, well, you cannot see it here very, very well, but one thing that you can do is that you can get really an idea on which is precisely the structure of the conformer uh, uh, in solution. And well, just yeah, simply the, the idea of this uh, figure is pretty much to show you, this is, uh, you see, you can calculate the total strain of the molecule, and you can also calculate the local strain of the molecule. So you see the, the rings in, in the, the bonds in length are those which are suffering substantially much more strain. And as you can see, when we have the eight member rings on these sides, they create all this strain that then you see it's, uh, it's uh, dispersed across the uh, conjugated backbone. Okay, and with this, uh, I will conclude this very bumpy presentation. Now it seems to work. Uh, uh, so, well, hopefully I, I have shown you all that, uh, uh, I hope that you agree with me that we have developed some very nice methodologies to synthesize giant nanographins, which include nanoribbons and other nanographins. So we have been able to obtain some of the largest uh, uh, structures uh, to this date. They're highly soluble, and this is really fantastic, believe me, it's the best thing that, this is the message that I want you to take home. They are soluble, so we can purify them by chromatography, we can characterize them very, very easily. We can investigate directly the size-property relationships. This is something that I, I haven't gone into the details. And also, you see, we have introduced a new approach to induce single-handed helicity in all these conformationally uh, flexible uh, graphene nanorivers. And with this, well, y if you are further interested, uh, you can actually, you see, read more of this story in, in these uh, three papers. 
And uh, I would like to thank to all the people who actually did the work. Uh, you see somebody mentioned that actually the talent uh, is uh, the, the people who actually does the work. You see, we just propose some things and they actually make them real. So you see, what we do is science fiction, what they do is uh, real science. And the real scientists here are Diego Cortizo La Calle and, and Juan Pedro Mora, who actually develop the first nanoribbon synthesis, the iterative synthesis, that then, together with Alberto, they were able to make the 2D giant nanographing. And then the last two systems, the uh, ultra long nano ribbon and this homochiral uh, nano ribbon bit has been synthesized by, by Rajib Dubey. I uh, rely really very, very closely with many collaborators, uh, especially with Manuel Mellefranco, who is really the person who provides all the theoretical support uh, to this work. Some things are really too complicated, and you need always a good theoretician near to you to help you to explain some of the things that you actually got, because things are getting very, very complicated. Um, and uh, also to uh, Akinori Saiki, because he has performed all the uh, time resolved microwave photoconductivity work that I, I haven't uh, discussed uh, today as well. Uh, then all these guys, because they support my salary, they help me to pay the bills. And you see, maybe this is uh, for Eugenio. Maybe you're interested, Eugenio. I'm, I have two positions. If you want to come and join us, maybe you see it's a good opportunity. Maybe, maybe Nathario too, yes. I, I, I'm not so sure. Maybe, I think uh, Eugenio could be a good addition. And uh, of course, I would like to thank Eugenio for this uh, fantastic opportunity of, for, uh, for bringing, me, bringing me back to Valencia after so, so long. You see, really these two years have, have felt dreadful without any trips. And it's been actually great to see many of you again face to face after so long, after so many years. And of course, I would like to thank you all very much for, for attending and for listening. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm a physicist, and it, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to see all these possibilities and, and to dream of the many possibilities that uh, your, your samples would have. Uh, the, uh, the, I have many questions I will ask you later, but ha have you tried uh, to, to make a transport measurements uh, through these kind of uh, ribbons? Uh, you mean single molecule transport? Yeah. Yes, th there is a paper coming up. <laughs> Oh, and ha have you succeeded? Uh, uh, to because uh, I, uh, one of the the, the difficulties I, I see the, in uh, in uh, doing electronic transport through this kind of uh, of uh, structures is that is is really to 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 put together the the Fermi energy of the metal electrodes with the with the with the <coughs> uh, yeah. Well, you see, the, the, the thing is, is if, if you choose, well, the, the, for, for us, for me, the, the most difficult thing has been, you, you see, I cannot tell you now <laughs> which are the, the, the anchor groups that we have selected to, to make the, the contacts. So these are actually key, you see, not only for the stability sure. of, the, of, the, um, of the junctions, but also because, as you say, the LOMOS and the LUMOS, ha the OMOS and the LUMOS have to be in the right uh, position, but you have to be also a little bit lucky. So the first thing you do is you test with what you are able to synthesize and see what happens. You fail a couple of times, and then you one day it works. And it works. So, so wow, you see, uh, I mean, what I can advance you is that uh, we have observed length decay constants in the range of 0 0.5. So you see, actually, it's, it's quite, quite nice. We haven't been able to put very, very large ribbons, but you see, larger than 20. Oh, fantastic! And one, one little more yeah, question. Sure, and uh, are you able to to make flakes uh, with holes? And uh, okay, you you um, putting together all these uh, structures. Are you able to make large flakes with holes? Uh, yes. With, uh, okay, we've been able to make them, and actually, we we published a paper very very recently. Uh, actually, in collaboration with 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 Carlos on on fuse aromatic networks. 
uh, of course, you see the, the crystallinity standards in comparison with, for example, MOVs is not the same, but you see, we, we, we are able to make them with a decent degree of crystallinity. So you see, it's, it's actually possible. You see, the, of course, the problem is with fused aromatic systems, as the reactions are not reversible, when you have a, a failure <laughs> or, or a, an error in your lattice, you cannot go back and fix it. But you see, you, can, you are able to make uh, quite decent crystalline systems these days. I yeah, will talk with you later. Thank you very much. Thank Fantastic. you. Carlos, any, any more questions? Please go ahead. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I really enjoy this talk, so I have three questions. I don't know if three. I can ask all of them. <laughs> uh, you see the chairman, the chairman okay. decides. The chairman uh, allows? I don't know whether... I, I don't know, the boss decides. Okay, oh. so uh, first at the beginning you mentioned that it's possible to find uh, structures using this technique uh, to obtain semiconductor graphene. Uh, how good are the optical electronic properties of those materials? Is it possible to think in semiconducting technology using graphene? And we need a fast and convincing answer. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I will summarize the. the well, in, in, prin in principle, yes. I mean, th th there has been people who has been able to make devices out of graphene nanoribbons that they have built on site. So, as you see, physicists by these top-down methods, they have been able to make these field-effect transistors. From these aromatic systems, it's uh, still quite difficult. Uh, because you see, I love solvents, but physicists hate solvents. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is the, the biggest problem. So for a physicist, a solvent is a large contaminant. So in principle, if we could sublime these guys, why not? Okay. So, but, but you see, you will have to, <laughs> you have to find ways to well, at the end, you see, you sublime your guy, you look for it, you put a mask, you put the contacts. It's, it should be doable. <laughs> okay. And the... Sorry, have to be okay. Uh, in, you mean in the in, in air? The solid, the solid in, in a bench, perfectly soluble. In solution, after one, two weeks with light, you see that they start decomposing. No. You see, the, the, the problem is that these four tip measurements, you require a, a lot of material. And for me, a lot of material is 10 milligrams. Well, I, we haven't done anything like this, N nothing. But, but you see, one, one of the problems could be the solubility of, of the ribbons. You see, in, in water or in, 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 in any, uh, I mean, organic, no, not organic, I mean, life media, <laughs> I, I actually doubt that they are soluble in anything with water. Yeah, very fast. Congratulations, Koke. Okay. Excellent talk. I just want to know, because I always wonder about what is the main selling point of creating a star shape nanographines? Uh, from our perspective, was really simply to see, uh, to see if, if we could overcome the synthesis challenge, the solubility challenge. You see, at the end, we need to get a feeling. You see, sometimes this is what I was saying about how difficult chemistry is that the papers doesn't really reflect it. Sometimes you just do simply exercises to see w how far you can go in some directions and once that you settle that, then you, you can make decisions. So the idea was really to see if this iterative approach would bring us very, very far, and how far. And this, well, there, there are going to be more surprises soon as well. So it's, it's, it's getting further and further. OK, so thank you. Uh, Koke, please join me in thanking me again for his beautiful Much presentation. Much And I guess.